Good afternoon, my friends. This is the Grim Flayer. Hope you're all doing very well today, and I hope you are ready for a return to some Mono Red Prowess gameplay content. Another league for you. It's been a little while. Pretty excited to show you this one, but first I've got to show you something else. This is a Reddit post. I will link to it in the description below, and I wanted to give this fellow here a shout out. Alexander Dakic, and I probably butchered your name, my friend. I do apologize for that, but this is a really great report. It's very exhaustive, it's very intensive, and it is very, very enlightening. So, I, uh, for anyone out there wanting to consume more Mono Red Prowess content, learn a little bit more about the deck, or, or just, you know, kind of bathe in the enjoyment of lightning bolts and lava darts, well, here you go. It's it's really worth the read. And I also did want to return the favor because, as you can see, Alexander did give me a shout-out alongside Ryan Overturf, and also he has qualified using Mono Red Prowess and in the tournament that he reports on here for his first ever Players Tour. So wanted to return the favor, give you a shout-out, and uh, my very best to you, my friend. Everybody out there, watch out for Alexander. Hopefully he'll be doing great things in the year of 2020 and also do check out hedron.tv they have some really good production value some really high quality content um, you can find alexander on there talking about mono red prowess a couple of videos i understand that more are to come so please do check all that out guys and uh, once again can Major congrats to Alexander. We love to see the Prowess players doing well. And speaking of Prowess players doing well, that's been me with my stock list lately. And I, as you may have seen, I may have mentioned on my previous video or elsewhere, I had seven straight foreign ones with my old list or something very like it. You know, a tweak here, a tweak there. So I kind of just didn't want to make any radical changes. Just don't fix what isn't broken, right? But then I... Played a bunch of mid-range, and then I went back to Prowess, had a 2-3, and three, had a 2-3 and three off camera. So, not a disaster, but it also broke our streak of really good results, and gave me license to change things up. But you know what? I actually didn't really make changes that were all that intensive, but what I did do is I added the third copy of Kiln Fiend, because this takes our threat count. We've got eight of the core cards plus three each of Kiln Fiend and Bedlam Reveler. That's a threat count of 14 main deck. 14 or even 15 is more of the norm with the lists that are putting up results. I've been on 13 for a long time, and I think there's a lot of good reasons to be on 13, but I decided, you know what, let's give that increased threat count a shout a shot, rather, and uh, let's just play the third Kiln Fiend. Of course, a second Fiend and a fourth Reveler is also viable, but given the nature of the rest of our build, I think the third Fiend is slightly better overall. Um, and when in doubt, opt for the more proactive thing with a deck like this. That's kind of my thinking. So we have cut the Warlord's Fury. Um, yeah, sorry, there were actually two Warlord's Furies the last time I played on the channel for you, I believe, and we just streamlined the list. We went all the way up to the fourth copy of Forked Bolt. I thought about trying Firebolt here, actually. Uh, both of these sorcery speed spells play well with Kiln Fiend, whereas if you're on, like, a Bobble build or a um, Steamkin build, I think you probably have to be on Burst Lightning almost, but... Um, with Kiln Fiend, we can play the sorceries, but you know what? Forked Bolt, it's still my spice, it's still my jam, so I just went up to the fourth copy of it. Finally, in the sideboard, the major, major thing that we did differently here is we added four copies of Leyline of the Void. So, some people um, have been asking me for advice on their prowess lists ever since I've been making content, and I have actually told people, I think Leyline is fine, but I'm actually not really a fan of it in our archetype compared to a mix of like Tormod's Crypts and Surgical Extractions. But in the two and three that I just mentioned, I did get kind of toasted by Dredge uh, through a Crypt and an Extraction one game, 
And, you know, I've also been enjoying Leyline and Pioneer Mono Black Aggro, so I said, why not? Let's give it a shot. I, I think the criticisms I've had of this card in our archetype are still valid, but at the same time, I've never said it's unplayable. So we're going to play the four copies of Leyline of the Void, give that a shot. Pretty streamlined sideboard. We did have to lose our three other pieces of Grave Hate. I also went down to one Dismember. Didn't really love that, but you know what? We can only uh, play so many black cards in our mono red deck, right? So anyway, guys, there you go. Um... Thank you, as always, to the Patreon supporters, and this is another replay, just because that's how my life's been going. Like, the time that I have to live record, I've been dedicating to the mid-range stuff, especially the donation leagues. And it's been like, the prowess stuff has been the deck that I turn to when I'm kind of playing to chill out off-camera. So, uh, I will get you some live recorded content soon for prowess, but for now, this is another replay, that's why, and I hope... You guys will stick with me for the duration. Let's get right into it. Well, it's round one, game one, guys. We won the die roll, but I've seen better opening hands. A six lander? Yeah, gotta throw that one back. Uh, we mulligan, and it's a pretty good six here, right? Pretty solid six, so we just bottom one of our three lands, and now we've got a really strong six. Opponent will keep seven, so we go ahead and lead on the Swifty. Smash him for one. Opponent goes Misty Rainforest into Snow-Covered Forest into Gilded Goose. So, uh, kind of a, a start that we don't want to see, because that's their ideal turn one play in any deck packing Goose, and obviously Goose brings its own kind of unique value against a red deck wins archetype like ours. And we also did not have removal, but good old Forked Bolt. We put the fourth copy in, we're more likely to draw it when we need it. That's what we hit right off the top. So... For me, you know, there are actually a couple different okay lines here, but it's really hard to pass up just bolting the bird, uh, literally in this case, although not the usual bolt, nor the usual bird that people think of. Uh, then we get to smash for two and play light up the stage, which is unmulliganing us, and we see the third land and more action, which is usually, frankly, what you want to see off of a turn two light up, right? So, back to the OP. Wooded Foothills getting a basic mountain, so this is not our typical goose deck, and main deck liquid metal coating certainly uh, exacerbates that read of not a typical goose deck, so um, my speculation proved to be correct, and here I was thinking this might be a type of deck that's basically liquid metal coating control that uh, uses Ancient Grudge as a really good like universal kill spell, right? So... That's what I was thinking, and indeed that's what this is, but um, we've got another Monastery Swift Spear, which is really nice, so we get to go crash through, spike you, smash for six, put him down to six. Pretty good, pretty good start. Opponent puts themselves down to five. They've got their Teamer colors online, Arkham's Astrolabe, then pass. We draw a second Bedlam Reveler, which is never very good. But we've only got three in the whole deck, so it's not like we're going to Monomorphose into another one. Oh no, we do. Good thing we're so far ahead, it really doesn't matter all that much. Uh, so we get to pitch the extraneous revs, and we find not a great three off of it, but good enough to threaten lethal even through removal here. So we go land first. Opponent will turn a Swifty into an artifact, and then indeed they go for an Ancient Grudge, but we have the Lightning Bolt going upstairs, which is going to get lethal anyway. So... Put the pedal to the metal, we put a lot of good pressure on, and we also went wide against a spot removal deck that's a pretty lethal combination because they are scrambling to keep their heads above water in two different ways. And uh, yeah, that's just one reason our deck is awesome. We mulligan to a six. We had some clunkiness at the top of our curve here with a triple Bedlam Reveler in hand, but we still put together a turn for a kill, right? So you gotta love it, and uh, yeah, so we are against a not meta deck, but one that plays a lot of meta cards like Urza, Arkham's Astrolabe, Gilded Goose, and Mishra's Bobble, so on and so forth. Let's go on to game two, see how we sideboard it. Okay, so you know, when you're against a non-meta deck or a newish brew... Um, it's, it's not like a fully new brew. People tr had like a really fringe, um, there was a really fringe presence of a liquid metal coating control deck before Urza, 
But now that Urza's around, now that Gilded Goose is around, I guess the idea, if I had to speculate, is that they can play this liquid metal control package and have it be really, really efficient if it all comes together. Plus, all of that stuff just generically contributes to, like, an Emery, Urza, Goose style of play, right? So, with that in mind, we do expect all of those cards, so I just sided in my spot removal, one dismember, three abrades, and I cut one Kiln Fiend, because I still think we want some of them, but especially on the draw against a spot removal deck, I'm sure they probably play Lightning Bolt or something else in addition to the Grudge and Coding combo. Um, so we trim a Kiln Fiend, we trim some, some Lava Spikes and call it good. We've got an opening six that plays the control game pretty well, which is what we sided in for. It's what we signed up for, so we keep it. Opponent keeps seven as well, and they go turn one Astrolabe. So back to us, and we're just passing. Holding up Lightning Bolt here. Opponent will go get a basic, play another Astrolabe, and then play Emery Lurker of the Lock for one. So Emery's milling over some of the cards we knew about, like Grudge and Coding, and some that we speculated would be there, like EE e. and Urza. So definitely, I mean, all four of those cards could, could pose a problem for us, right? But we bolt Emery, so they're not getting them back anytime soon. Back over to us, and we're going to Monomorphose just looking for a threat. You don't really love to use it in that way, but mission somewhat accomplished. We Monomorphose into a Crash Through, we Crash into a Kiln Fiend, so we've got a threat for next turn. We're obviously a little bit behind schedule with all this. Back to the OP, they play another Astrolabe and another Emery. we got to remember they can flash back these grudges. It's some nice value. We've drawn Monastery Swift Spear, so it's actually a pretty interesting spot. We could um, take a more aggressive stance of going Swifty into a Braid, killing the Emery, getting the pressure down as early as possible, or we can play for a more powerful turn next turn. And that indeed is what I opted to do. So um, Forked Bolt killing Emery is more a more efficient use of a spell than a Braid is. Um, also lets us deploy the Kiln Fiend, but opponent's got an Abrade to answer us right back, and then they've got Emery number three, so it's a little bit ridiculous. We also see Karn, the Great Creator, uh, and Altar of the Brood, so super interesting deck from the OP. Um, sometimes you can really get punished for just, like, spending resources killing a legendary creature and they just have replacements, but in our case, we've been so efficient doing so, I think it's still fine, and the opponent's just kind of really spinning their wheels. And uh, we get to have that good turn this turn, even though it's no Kiln Fiend. Swifty, Crash Through, Abrade the Emery, Tack for three. Opponent will shock in a steam vents and then jam Karn, the Great Creator. And they go ahead and take down. I think I remember them giving this some thought. They probably thought about just animating an Astrolabe to present, you know, develop the board presence, including getting Karn's loyalty higher. But in the end, they go for Ensnaring Bridge. But it's really interesting because they still have three cards in hand. We've got to remember that. So we draw Light up the stage. What a nice draw. What a nice, nice draw. That allows us, like before, let's say we had absolutely nothing, maybe we would be pressed into just spiking the Karn and attacking them or whatever, right? Fiery Islet draw notwithstanding, but spiking them allows us to spike them, which advances the clock, and turns on Spectacle, which is very efficient, and guarantees us the ability to attack Karn off the field this turn. So that is the play, and unfortunately we don't hit anything too, too crazy off of the um, off of the light up, but hey, it's still value. They're still usable cards, and they might give us an out if the opponent has like an Urza here or something. That dismember will be nice. But they don't. They play that ensnaring bridge, and then they're simply passing, unable to empty out their hand, which is good for us. So. End step, we crack the eyelet, we find Bedlam Reveler, we've got Lightning Bolt, we got a lot going on. We got a lot of couple we got a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline. So bolt the OP, put them to eight, cast the reveler, and we've got a handful of stuff. We've got to remember that you can attack, of course, with these prowess creatures under the bridge, and then pump them after the fact. So might as well take that line. That's what we do. Opponent's got no blocks, so we're just going to go ahead and fire up the Lava Dart, go for lethal. We don't even need to flash it back. They're just going to scoop. So there we go, guys. There we go. A pretty 
comprehensive win 2 nothing over the Urza, the Liqui Metal Urza deck, Teamer colors. Interesting build. Uh, it's got a lot of ways to get there with Emery looping the value with Karn the Great Creator taking over the game with Urza taking over the game. And you can imagine them playing a really good control game in general with like red and blue control cards plus the grudge encoding synergy. Um, but, you know, in our case, we were just a little bit too fast and a little bit too beefy for them. Like we had good card advantage online in both games and we really put a good clock on in game one in game two we had to spend a lot more time controlling their board but when we turned the corner we turned it really quickly on the play again for round two and this time we don't have to maul in our game one it's a really nice opening hand nothing uh nothing bad to say about it Five lands, a one-drop threat, a couple monomorphosi, a bolt, a light up the stage. Doesn't get too much better than this. Opponent keeping seven as well, and they go Verdant Catacombs Pass. So my first suspicion, I think it should be most people's first suspicion, but especially mine, because that's the main archetype I play. I'm suspicious for Jund, for Rock, for another BGX deck. So to that end, uh, we have a couple of interesting options here. The most... The highest ceiling option would be to go Monomorphos, Monomorphos, and then, like, worst case scenario, Lightning Bolt, light up the stage, swing for 5, opponent will be at 11 after they fetch, assuming they don't have to shock, but, of course, against Fatal Push or Lightning Bolt or whatever, that's a little bit risky, right? So... I think I'm against a spot removal deck. I think I'm against a value deck, so I'm going to prioritize resolving light up the stage uh, at an opportune time. So that's what we did. Um, we go light up, second main, and we hope to find another one mana threat. Uh, another soul scar would be better, but and you don't even have to play the Swifty here. Of course, you could just hold up Lightning Bolt or whatever and then play Swifty next turn, but I think if they had spot removal, they would probably have used it there, so I'm pretty cool just running out the Swifty. Even if they have one piece of spot removal, this is fine. Opponent gets a Tomb tapped, plays a Forest, and plays a Wall of Roots, so the Verdant Catacombs read was not correct. We are against probably Yawgmoth combo. That's really what you should think, seeing Wall of Roots backed up by green black lands but you know there could be some court of calling other value or combo deck going on but we're suspicious for yawgmoth now oh i think i remember what happened here i think this was a major bra moment on my part let's see i think i think this is where i made my mistake um i think i think probably the only obvious mistake of the league but a mistake nevertheless so we kick it off with two monomorphosi that's not a mistake that's exactly what you want to do and we've just got a handful of burn spells and yeah the, so what i did here is i was just thinking i was just running through all the different lines what is the best way to maximize my damage this turn and is it worth just like cleanly killing the wall of roots to slow them down as well but it sucks to have to spend enough um and expend enough points of damage to kill a 0-5, like, that's a lot of commitment to controlling the board. So while all these ideas and lines were percolating around in my mind, I eventually committed to one, we do just kill the Wall of Roots, which is all well and good. But if you see here, we are going to do 10 damage, we cast one other spell, we do 12, and Lightning Bolt is fine, but not quite lethal, and Lava Dart is fine, but not quite lethal. Um, we're putting them to like th one or two, like three with this line or two with the other line. Um, so I did. I said, hey, let's just bolt upstairs. This is totally fine. But all the while, I completely forgot that this is expiring at the end of the turn. So I just tossed away the Lava Dart for no reason. Obviously should have used the Lava Dart there, probably not even flashing it back, just using it and keeping the Bolt in the back pocket. They'd definitely be dead next turn. So like I said, bra moment, don't forget about the obvious stuff. Like I, I was figuring out what tiny line, what corner case 
line of how I use my burn spells here is optimal, but I kind of forgot about something obvious. So now that we have only Forked Bolt in hand, the opponent is actually not dead, which is a little bit rough, but you know what? Against this Yawgmoth combo, realistically, especially game one, when you're this far ahead on life total, you're not really going to lose anyway. Like, that's just not how their combo generally tends to work. Um, they need to be competitive on life totals under most circumstances to keep pace with you. So we put them to one with a fort bolt, we attack, we force, uh, we take care of the front half of strangle root, and now we're forcing them to find at least another creature to block so they're not dead on board. And hey, they do find the Yawgmoth, so that's a little bit scary, but we've got a million outs, and we just rip the lava spike off the top. So you know what? Never didn't have it. Never didn't have it. And again, even if we brick there super high percentage of draws kill them. We've got Islet to dig. We've got Bedlam Reveler able to be cast. We've just, like, we've got a very low fail rate. Even if we draw land, we've got the Islet to crack. We're pretty much going to win from there no matter what. But, but, let that, let that be a lesson to you, my friends. Don't get wrapped up uh, so closely in the minutia that you forget about more obvious things like I did here with Light Up the Stage's Lava Dart going into Exile. So, didn't get punished for it. Pretty strong progression, honestly, really strong progression that we had, even though the opponent presented some stuff that was sometimes, like, nominally a problem for a deck like ours. We just kind of burst right through it. So, good times. Let's check out game two. All right, guys, it's game two, and as you can see, we've done some really heavy sideboarding. So the first thing that I did is just like in round one, we brought in all of our spot removal, which is three abraid, one dismember, and we also had to bring in four ley lines of the void. So obviously that requires eight slots coming out. I chose to trim my kiln fiends here because... They play some removal post board, and I assume it comes in against us. Things like Decay and Trophy uh, do see some play. But perhaps more importantly, their deck just blocks really, really well against Kiln Fiend, right? So obviously, if you're uncontested, Kiln Fiend is great. But like traditionally, I've beaten this deck just by kind of controlling the board and applying pressure. Controlling the board and applying pressure. Kiln Fiend does that nowhere near as well as our one drops do, so we side into removal and into graveyard hate. The Kiln Fiend's gotta go. Um, I also cut all four lava spikes, because again, we are committing to a plan that's more involved with controlling the board. Finally, we round things out with a Bedlam Reveler um, getting cut, which, you know, it's a fine card in the matchup, but we want to commit again to board control plus early pressure on their life total. But, I mean, this has got a lot of really good cards, but we're not going to do it with a zero lander, so we throw it back. One of the cool things about having Leyline of the Void in your deck is that, like, the forced mulligans don't feel as bad because you can maybe justify mulling aggressively for Leyline anyway. The opponent has mulled as well. We go down to six. This is a somewhat functional six. You know, we just bottom of Bedlam Reveler and it's fine, but the opponent mulligan to five, and I said, okay, we're kind of like not really doing the early pressure thing, like we're probably having to go Forked Bolt into Light Up the Stage on turn two, unless we naturally hit our lands and, and stuff, and then are we really beating the deck? I don't know. So this was a borderline, I think this is keepable, but I did not keep it. I decided to go to five. And still no ley line, seeing three seven landers, no ley line. Not a good omen for our new adaptation of the tech. But anyway, we bottom a couple of these cards here. Strangely enough, kind of have to bottom a monomorphos. But look, we're on the lava dart into light up plan for turn two. And uh, promptly, right off the top, ooh, this one hurts. We draw ley line of the void naturally. Pretty horrendous stuff. You know, if we had Faithless Looting, this would be another story. But this is the exact type of reason why I historically have not really liked ley line in our deck. But, you know, the opponent did mull the five as well. So maybe they don't have, maybe they have some incoherence in their progression as well. One can only hope. Uh, we draw land number three. Sure, that's fine. So... Plan A, Lava Dart, light it up, and we find some kind of bad stuff. That Bedlam Reveler specifically, pretty bad right about now. Uh, pretty punished to draw into that this early. Okay, opponent smacking us again, and then here comes just a hard cast Reclamation Sage. So talk about incoherence. Opponent just hard casts a 2-1. They've only got two cards left in hand. If only we had a good progression to really punish them, but we don't. But we don't. So... 
Drawing another land is pretty rough here. Obviously kick things off with a Monomorphos, and we just got nothing. So we crack Fiery Islet. We find another Monomorphos, so we're continuing to dig through the deck. This time we remember to use the Lava Dart before it goes away, and that's about all we can do. Um, I decided to kill the 2-1 rather than to kill the front half of the Geist, just because we're going to lose to their beats, so like a 3-2 and a 2-1 beating down. We're going to lose to that if we don't take care of that. Um, also worth noting that there is a world in which you can monomorphose into double black and hard cast Leyline of the Void in a situation like this, but that's not, that's not our prerogative here. That's not what we're trying to do. Couldn't have done it last turn anyway. Didn't have four mana. So back to us. And we don't have four mana again on turn four because we cashed in a land. So we are just flooding like crazy. And Monomorphos kicking it off into a light up the stage that we can barely manage to cast. And it's just another mountain, another ley line. Pretty miserable, guys. Our deck is just failing us right now. Just absolutely failing us this game. And we're just losing to a hasty 2-1, the Green Blood Ghast, right? They go Wall of Roots, we go Soul Scar Mage, I'm just hitting play here. We lose another Ley Line. Opponent finds Yawgmoth, they finally get there, they get the combo online. Um, with Yawgmoth on the stack, I did decide to kill Strangle Root Geist. It's just kind of uh, gives them less to work with as far as their combo goes, but we've got big problems. We like probably have to draw uh, Dismember right now or something to stay competitive. We don't. We draw a creature, which is decent, you know, Swifty into Fourth Bolt. It's decent, but feeling starting to feel like too little too late. So we take care of Strangle Root Geist. In response, they'll get the value, sack it with Yawgmoth. Then it's back to the OP, and they have a Birds of Paradise. They cash in the birds to kill our Swifty. They attack with Yawgmoth. And then, second main, they slam an obstinate Baloth, which is, yeah, a little bit too beefy for us to contend with. We just draw another Soul Scar. We are very, very dead, soundly defeated. After mulling to five, you know, finding Ley Lines of the Void and Bedlam Revelers off of our early draws and light ups, not gonna cut it, not gonna cut it. So, eh, if we had a decent progression, yeah, we could have really punished them. The opponent had very little going on for quite some time, but. We did not. Um, you know, that that six, the six that we threw back, that might have got us there. I don't know. Don't know. Obviously, pretty hard to say. Would depend on how everything came off the top of the deck for us. But we lose. We lose, and we go back to the drawing board for round three. Game three, excuse me. Round two, game three. So here for game three, guys, I just decided to get slightly more threat-oriented. We took one of our abrades back out, put the Bedlam Reveler back in. Kind of a corner case thing, but, you know, a minor change, I think, perfectly fine. This is a very interesting decision here because we had a one land seven. That in and of itself is kind of risky. And again, with Ley Lines of the Void in our deck that we can't usually hard cast, we have incentives to mull aggressively towards them. But... The upside of this hand is huge. It's got three one drops. So if we just hit the second land, I think this is going to really reward us, especially on the play. Turn one Soul Scar back to you. They go turn one Young Wolf and boom, mountain right off the top. What a beautiful sight, this Odyssey basic land. You love to see it. So the play here is pretty clear. We send everything out onto the field and turn them all sideways. Back to the OP. Wall of Roots is the play, and it is back to us. We draw Light Up the Stage. It's a good card, right? It's a pretty good card, but is that what we're going to do? And I decide, yes, you know, a Braid, not really that appealing in the face of a 0-5 and an Undying Creature, respectively. So uh, the upside of just doing this right here, right now, is pretty good, because our attacks are still fine. Our attacks are still reasonable. And if we uh, had had like a third land here in the exile zone after this, it might have actually been interesting to get really aggressive with our lava dart here. But as it is, uh, we have two really good cards in there, but no third land. So we just have to content ourselves with a decent attack here. I mean, opponent chooses not to block with a young wolf, so it turns into a more than decent attack. We get across for six, pretty good. So opponent plays another land. 
Wall of Roots gets involved here, and it is Kitchen Finks. So, yeah, it's a good turn for them. They play a Shockland painlessly. They make the Finks. They're sitting behind three creatures. Seems pretty good. We draw land number three. Uh, that also seems pretty good. It's something we more or less need to see here at some point. So, kick things off as usual, when you can, with a Monomorphos. And we find another Soul Scar Mage. Now, the next move here is to abrade the Kitchen Finks. And note what happens here. The opponent does not get Persist. You do not pass go. You do not gain two life. And here is why. Persist reads when this creature dies. If it had no minus one, minus one counters on it, it comes back. But Soulscar gave it some counters. So that's how that works. And that's a really nice little upside against Kitchen Finks for our Soulscar Mage. We turn them all sideways here. See what the opponent does, and indeed, they are feeling the heat. They're going to double block, so we just go upstairs of the bolt, uh, allowing us to kill, cleanly kill the Wall of Roots in combat, put the opponent down to five, take care of the front half of Young Wolf, and we're in a great position, obviously. Opponent has to go to four via Nurturing Peatland, but they do get the Yawgmoth down. Uh, note that Yawgmoth is protection from humans in our all of our one-drops, are of the human persuasion, but doesn't matter. We've got the kill on Yogmoth. We abraid him, reduce him to a weenie, to a negative 1-1, one, one, how low the mighty have fallen, and then, of course, we just flash back Lava Dart to finish him off. We get to attack for lethal, and that's the game. Even had the follow-up play of Light Up the Stage or Soul Scar Mage just for style points, but didn't need it. So, GG, we get there against Yawgmoth, and that's what I mean. That's kind of why I'm a little bit medium on Leyline overall. It's like, a lot of these graveyard-based decks, we can just race them. If they are dredge, yeah, that's a little bit tougher. Their nut draws are a little bit nuttier. They have things like Creeping Chill. Arguably, they can control the board better, too, under certain circumstances than a deck like Yawgmoth. But, you know, we can still race them. We really can still race them. And if we're racing plus able to play the Crypts or the Surgicals that we draw, not in our opening hand, but like on turn one, two, three... I think that's good enough, personally, for me, in my experience. And against the Yawgmoth decks, that also applies, but we can also just straight up muscle our way through them like we did in games one and three here. So, uh, yeah, this match not really selling me on the Ley Lines of the Void. As always, guys, you can let me know, and as always, I do think either configuration is at least valid. I don't think it's strictly incorrect to play Ley Lines or, or to play them, um, or to not play them, rather, but... There we go. We take down Yogmoth combo. See you for round three. Winning lots of die rolls today, my friends, and we've got a real solid keep. Nothing at all wrong with this, just like a classic prowess hand. Not the first one we've seen today either, so good times. We uh, smack the opponent for one. They go Verdant Catacombs turn one, and this time it is a BGX deck, it appears. They will Thought Seize away our Light Up the Stage, and that is the correct take for sure. So, uh, against an Attrition deck, and also just following the cues of our hand, we just shove all in here. Spike you, Bolt you, Smack you for three, push you to seven. And opponent will play a Shock Land tapped, and they will pass. So... Back to us. Unfortunately, we drew another basic land, so we're just about out of gas. But we've got a little more damage to eke out here. Let's go for it. We Lava Dart, and the opponent does have a Fatal Push. That is a beating. That sucks. So, opponent is at 6. They're at a Virtual 5 with a Lava Dart, but we're kind of out of options. However, now they're at 5 at a Virtual 4. Lots of things, lots of draws we have do kill them. And the opponent has a long, long way to go to both stabilize and to kill us. Especially in game one, where they're not likely to have many sources of life gain, probably just scavenging ooze, which I can tell you firsthand, not every Jund player is playing right now. Um, but indeed, we are against Jund. They lily the last mountain out of our hand, and we top deck Swifty. That's a really good draw. Now, um... One option here is to go after the Liliana, so she cannot Edict us, but I actually don't think that's correct. I think that's playing not to lose. I would much rather Lava Dart them and hit them for two. Now they're at two. Now they're dead to Lava Spike. They're dead to Lightning Bolt. They're even dead to Fort Bolt. I think, that is, I think that's the play there for sure. So opponent, of course, gets to Edict us, keep their Lily around. They just play a land tapped and they pass. 
and we draw light up the stage. So opponent with a good play here, upkeep, K command to get the card out of our hand, which is a way for them to beat like a creature or a lava spike. So we're kind of uh, not too upset about it though, because we just drew an uncastable light up the stage anyway. So back to the OP. Nurturing Peatland into Renin 6, into cracking the Peatland, buy back the Peatland with Renin 6, take up with Liliana. So this is the value dream for Jund. They get to loop a land that draws them cards. They get to have relatively free pitches to Liliana here. Um, but again, their big problem is just that they're completely on the ropes. All we have to do is draw one of our many, many forms of lethal. So we draw Monomorphos into Bedlam Reveler, and as you can see here, I just reflexively tried to cast it. Amazingly enough, despite how big our graveyard is, we actually do not quite have enough. One, two, three, four, five spells only, not six. So, uh, we don't have it. Pretty annoying. Um, and of course, the opponent begins by getting it out of our hand with Liliana. Then they go down to one. What could this be? Is this what we fear? It sure is. It is the Scoos. They found the Scoos. Now they're stabilizing, they're gaining a bunch of life, they've got a clock to present, and we draw yet another uncastable card light up the stage. So we had uh, four draws because one of them was Monomorphos to find a bolt, a spike, any number of other things. Lava Dart's lethal too. We have a ton and a ton and a ton of lethal. Didn't manage to do it. Didn't manage to do it. Jund is a tough matchup. It really is. Not as tough as BG Rock, but still tough. And the fact that we lost game one under those circumstances, ooh, that's a little bit of a hard pill to swallow. You would love to just push through them in game one when they're not prepared for you, when they didn't have the right half of the deck necessarily, and then try to win one of the post side games. So now we've really got our work cut out for us. Let's see what we can do. Okay, so one of the weaknesses of my current build is it does not have all that much to do against Jund. Um... Kiln Fiend times two is what I chose to bring out. We still leave one in, you know, we still want... There's an argument for not losing out on threat density against the spot removal deck, but Kiln Fiend against Jun specifically, when we think of not only Fatal Push, but Lightning Bolt, Coligan's Command, Collective Brutality, it just dies way too much at too bad of a tempo loss a lot of the time. So the Kiln Fiends are indeed what I sided out. We brought in one Dismember and one Shrine of Burning Rage. Now, Shrine is a really good grindy card, but it's a lot worse against the grindy decks that play Coligan's Command than the ones that don't. So even in the specific choice of our grindy tech, we are not that well prepared for Jund. Uh, this is a keep. It's a decent keep. It's a reasonable keep, but it's a little bit light on gas. We don't have any top end. We don't have any flood insurance. We are just kind of hoping this is good enough. Uh, plus, of course, the top of our deck. So, OP keeping seven. Swifty, smack you, pass. They go fetch land, pass, so we go Swifty again. And at this point, I'm kind of deciding that because we drew a fourth mountain, just shoving all in and hoping they don't have anything, there's the temptation to do that, right? Because, like, that's what our hand does. But I decide that I kind of want to play around their spot removal. Kind of want to play around Collective Brutality in particular. I also want to be able to point a bolt at the board if they play, like, a Scavenging Ooze here or something. So I do decide to just play a little bit more KG here and say go. They've got a Lightning Bolt, sure. Not much we can do about that. Um, and again, like, the need to dump out our hand is not as significant because our stuff is all low curve and we don't have mana sinks or top end things. So, anyway, back to us, land number three. We draw Soul Scar Mage, which is fine. Uh, that gives us pretty much a license to just main phase bolt. We'll attack here and we can still take the same stance we were last turn, right? By holding up Lightning Bolt, playing around certain things that way, namely Ooze and Brutality. We play the Soul Scar and we pass, and look, they're already down to 12 anyway, so we are putting on a decent amount of pressure, despite playing a little bit more cautiously. End step opponent will cycle Baron more. I haven't been able to justify playing this in Jund lately. I think slots are too tight, and I like being on 23 lands, but ah, I love me some Baron more in Jund. That's so cool. Big, big fan of it. And look at that. Opponent will lead on Brutality. Escalating just once for the drain, so we don't get to totally blow them out, but still bolting in response, keeping our Soul Scar Mage alive. That is pretty good, right? So, opponent just plays a tomb untapped. 
It's back to us. We've got to rip some gas off the top here. We rip Monomorphos, which is pretty much the ideal draw, but we only Monomorphos into a land. We crack it. We find Skullscar Mage. Okay, like it's decent. It was a decent turn. Could be better, but uh, could definitely be a lot worse too. We attack OPs at 7, and while we are mostly tapped out, they go for the K command, discard in shock mode. So really, it's just kind of a 3 mana shock there, because we just had a mountain rotting in hand anyway. Back to us, we kick things off with a Forked Bolt. It's a fine draw off the top. Uh, Lightning Bolt or Lava Spike would have been lethal. Forked Bolt is not, but we'll still certainly take it, especially because they didn't have removal here. So opponents at one, they take their draw step, they scoop it up. Whatever's in their hand cannot beat our one twos on board. Maybe they would need defection in order to do so. They can't do that. Uh, so that one feels like it was pretty close to us just not having enough juice to get over the line. We had like a moderate opening hand, and we had some moderate gas off the top. And I think playing around Brutality is probably what won us that game more than anything. Not only because the way it all lined up was pretty well, worked out pretty well for us, but if we had sequenced differently, they might have gone for all three modes escalation with Brutality. Maybe we get caught with like a Forked Bolt in our hand. I don't know. Obviously, it could have gone a few different ways, but we do manage to get one back against Jun, but it was close. I think it was a lot closer than it looked, and it might be a little bit harder on the draw for Game 3. All right, guys, we've got a really nice keep here for game three. It's a two-lander, it's got a threat, it's got burn in action, it's got the Monomorphos, which is always good, except against, like, Thalia, Guardian of Thraben, or Rule of Law, or something corner case like that. And it's got the two-for-one of Light at the Stage, so this is the perfectly balanced hand that we want to see against Jund. Uh, the Jund opponent will keep seven, though. I don't think our opponents have mulliganed this league. You hate to see that. And we draw Bedlam Reveler, so more top-end gas coming our way. That is awesome. Uh, our Soul Scar will get Lightning Bolted. Opponent will play Forest, though. So Forest really does give us the green light to shove all in here if we draw a Haste Threat, which is what we do. I guess we're not really shoving all in, but it, I, I should say this. It gives us the line to attack with Swifty and use that to trigger Spectacle, which is a heck of a lot more efficient in multiple ways than having to go, like, Burn Spell Light Up, which, if they had showed us Swamp here, we probably would have been priced into doing so, but because we were not scared of removal off of Basic Forest, we got to do that. Very, very nice turn. A couple more pieces of gas waiting in the wings for us. Opponent plays a Raging Ravine, so they've got three land drops. They've made all three land drops, but no black mana yet. And all they can do is Renin Six, taking up for no value. So, whoo we draw another Monomorphos. It is on. It is on. It's about to get a little crazy in here. So, Monomorphos into another Monomorphos, into Forked Bolt. And here, you know, obviously you could play Crash Through. I did decide to go light up the stage because with our hand, we really want to hit land number three. We're seeing an extra two cards. You'd really think we, we would have hit the third land by now. We are 16 cards deep already on turn three. Sadly, it was not to be. So we're going to lose the Crash Through. But hey, consolation is we have two more cards waiting in the wings. We filled up our graveyard. We smashed in for five. And an even better consolation is the opponent just doesn't have a black land. I'm sure they have a bunch of dead cards cards in hand and they just scoop it up so uh, I guess this is one of the benefits of playing prowess is like I'm sure this is what went through the opponent's mind they're like my seven is functional it's got a lightning bolt which is they really want early removal it's got you know probably three lands maybe four lands a Ren and Six, if they just draw a fetch land, they're off to the races, they're highly functional. Maybe they have some good top end stuff going on too. Maybe they have like a fatal push and a collective brutality, they just need the black land. So the fact that we can put such a good goldfish kill together on the back of a turn one threat means that we kind of can spook the opponent into keeping a risky hand like this one. This was a risky hand. Now, statistically, they should have drawn another land. It should statistically be black. I assume they kept a two or three lander uh, to begin with, the lands that we're seeing here. But they didn't, and we kind of got a free win on the back of it. But you know what? Number one, again, that's some equity that naturally comes with our deck being able to goldfish so quickly. And number two, look at our progression. 
we were definitely able to compete with even a good Jund progression perfectly well in our own right. This is what our deck can do. If you draw the right cards, it can grind with the best of them. So there we go, guys. We take down a tough matchup in Jund after having lost game one. No easy feat, but we did get there. Um, thanks partially to the opponent's progression and partially to our own. And here we are, my friends, for round four. I do hope you're enjoying this replay, and we've got a nice hand, a uh, very nice hand here. And the opponent is taking a mulligan down to six. We're on the play for the fourth time in a row, so some things going our way this league, to be sure. Opponent will go once upon a time into Botanical Sanctum. And then they will simply pass the turn. Not a play you see every day. Uh, this is something you should recognize as Neoform. They have not always played this card, but they are now. And that's uh, that's just kind of a red flag to me anyway. You know, in theory, you could see maybe like a Simic Merfolk build playing once upon a time or something, but they'd have a turn one play, right? So anyway, we smack in for one, and then we're expecting Neoform. We gotta put the turn three kill together. Uh, so it's clearly Kiln Fiend in Go. Hope we can pull it off. Opponent goes Monomorphos. So Neoform confirmed. They go Monomorphos again. Into Once Upon a Time, finding Chancellor of the Tangle. Okay, uh, probably just a green card that they need to exile. Um, but anyway, we're going to try to make it not matter. So we go Monomorphos. We find another land, but the Lava Darts here... Or maybe we found another Lava Dart, I don't remember. Either way, these darts are all we need because Kiln Fiend plus Lava Dart is ridiculously OP. So we're about to smack for, let's see, we'd put them to 14 with the two other Lava Darts. Kiln Fiend would be attacking for 16. Soul Scar Mage would be attacking for 6. So we would be putting them to negative 8 on turn 3 without having drawn like much burn at all. And with Mana Despair. Uh, that's what we call a classic overkill, turn three massacre at the hands of Kiln Fiend and Soul Scar Mage. So there you go. Neoform didn't put the didn't put the turn two kill together, so they got T3. All right, so for that Jund matchup, you could argue that maybe we should have like another piece or two for that type of matchup, and or a different piece or two against Neoform. We don't really have much, and I don't think we should have much. Like we. Just can't really do anything better than race them. What I did do is I subbed out a Bedlam Reveler for one copy of Blood Moon, because they can be soft to Blood Moon. Frankly, neither card is probably going to stop them, but I think just splitting some split between Reveler and Moon, I don't know if it should be 2-1 or 1-2 or whatever, that seems fine to me, right? But uh, ultimately, we are just executing plan A. Uh, we are racing them as hard as humanly possible, and to that end, we cannot keep a hand, uh, cannot keep a seven anyway, without a one mana threat or a kiln fiend. Gotta send it back, and uh, we mull we mulligan down to this hand, and this hand, it's got two one mana, three one mana threats rather, and a kiln fiend and two lava darts. Definite keep. Obviously, need to draw the second land, so we'll bottom one of our soul scar mages, and uh, hope it's good enough. Opponent has mulled as well, down to five. Um, they're, they've got the same mentality. They're keeping. They're they're looking for the race. They're looking for the race. They will go tranquil thicket pass to us, um, and we will draw the second land promptly off the top. So, under many circumstances, you want to play the soul scar first and save the swifty. But here we are just eking every possible point of damage out that we can, and specifically we have the plan to play kiln fiend on turn two. So. Um, that's what makes sense there. Unfortunately, the opponent looks like they have the combo here, so they go Pact for Allosaurus Rider, and then you know what happens next. They Neoform into Gristlebrand. They're going to draw. They're going to draw again. But it, then they... Uh, then they this looked like a desperation move to me. I am not a Neoform expert, but it looks like a desperation move to me. Cashing in one of their two lands simply to cycle after they already drew that many. So they don't appear to have the combo, and indeed they don't. They have to go to cleanup and pitch all of those cards. And if we just had this fiery islet as a mountain, we could kill them this turn. 
And we draw the mountain, so this is rather hilarious. They put themselves to four. They've got an 8-8 lifelink on the field, so we just lava dart them to death. They see what's coming. They scoop it up. Now, granted, now, granted, they had their own summoner's pack to contend with. I don't know if they can beat their own summoner's pack there, but it doesn't matter. We didn't even need to find out. We just lava dart them to death. Kind of hilarious, kind of hilarious if you ask me. So, we got lucky here, guys, make no mistake. They mulliganed down, they comboed off on turn two, they didn't manage to put together the combo, they couldn't find a way to keep going, they were lacking, I suppose, uh, nourishing shoal. And uh, beyond that, in general, being able to put together a turn three kill in game one, we, we have that a good amount of the time, but we certainly don't have that every time. And this is a pretty bad matchup. It's one you do not want to see. And we just got the luck of the draw here. We just got enough luck to cleanly 2-0 Neo for him. Certainly not what I would uh, put my money on in a vacuum, but we got there. Luck is going our way thus far, and we are 4-0 with the updated list, my friends. Let's check out the fifth and final round of this Modern League. And here we are, closing out the league with a opening hand that's pretty good. Pretty good. We're on the draw for the first time in the league, I believe. And the opponent will keep seven. Leading on Mishra's Bauble into Watery Grave into Thought Seas. So... Okay, uh, this could be a couple different things, but they take away our Soul Scar Mage, which means they're pretty unlikely, in my view, to have removal in hand. So we just cantrip and we pass. Opponent goes Snow Covered Island, Arkham's Astrolabe back to us. We've got another light up the stage, so it's time to try to get these online. Lava Dart, you light it up, and we find a third land in a creature, which is pretty nice. Pretty much just what we wish to see. Opponent will go Misty Rainforest, pass. And at this point, I'm a lot more suspicious for the blue-black Urza deck than for anything like Shadow, whereas turn one could easily, just as easily, have been Grixis Shadow. We've drawn Kiln Fiend, so my play here is going to be this. We play our land, we play Swifty. We're going to try to attack. If we connect, uh, we can have a couple different options, including playing Kiln Fiend or playing Light Up the Stage and maybe something else. But if the opponent has Fatal Push, which they do, then instead we can simply jam the Kiln Fiend. Like I said, I read them on turn one for not having removal. So that means maybe they drew a Fatal Push and probably they do not do not have more removal. At least that is my expectation. Obviously they can draw anything and whatever, but uh, this is why it's important to try to read the opponent based on their sequencing what they have, what they don't have, at least uh, to the best of our determination. Opponent makes the fourth land drop, then just says go. So we're going to kick things off with a Lava Spike. I think going Lava Spike, light up the stage, all main phase, it's going to give them a tension between, like, one of the things they could have right now besides just more removal is Cryptic Command. So we want to provide a tension between, like, bouncing our Kiln Fiend versus countering high impact spells, right? So... Uh, we find another Kiln Fiend and another land off of Light Up. So one thing we can do is just simply attack and still kind of be threatening lethal actually with the Lava Dart, but more accurately maybe just like um, either bluffing other things or just getting a big chunk of damage across. But at the same time, casting Crash Through is kind of like a kind of a free roll in some ways. Um, and basically, they're either going to have removal or they're not here, right? Or a cryptic command to bounce or not. So they're going to get Mystic Sanctuary, putting Fatal Push back into the deck, and then, or back on top, rather, but then they shuffle it away with War of Invention. So I guess they did just want it back in the deck, and they'd have a Fatal Push anyway. So unless I just misinterpreted that, I think they had a push in hand the whole time. And... Uh, Again, given our read, that's a little bit unlucky, but our cantripping does reward us because we still get to play a threat in the second main. Once again, opponent with a Mystic Sanctuary buying back the Fatal Push. It's a really a, the type of loop that I do dislike, I've got to say. Not a fan of it, but we're going to try to muscle our way through it. So, Crash Through is the draw, and it's a perfectly reasonable thing to lead off on, and we draw Bedlam Reveler. Now that's, now that's a good one. That's looking like a good one. So... We swing in with the Soul Scar Mage. We'll get a Lava Dart in. 
and then they're going to go cryptic command, bouncing their own mystic sanctuary and drawing that fatal push off the top. Then they fatal push. So opponent just like keeping pace with us, but we just keep presenting threats. We keep uh, developing our hand and our graveyard indeed. So Kiln Fiend go. Opponent doing a bunch of Urza stuff. Astrolabe, Mystic Sanctuary for like the fourth time this league, buying back Fatal Push, and then passing to us. They will bobble. And th so they know about this uh, Forked Bolt, I believe, so we'll lead off with that. And then we just jam a Reveler, once again giving them that tension with Cryptic Command, but Reveler Resolves, which is big, big game. And doing that main phase additionally allows us to, to have this happen. Monastery Swift Spear off the top is pretty good, because again, we know they have a Fatal Push, so we know shoving all in on Kiln Fiend does not make sense, but getting another body down, getting another point of damage across, that's pretty good, right? So... And no need to shove any harder than that, in my view, with Lava Darts. Like, we've got we've got the upper hand here. Opponent makes a land drop, and they say go. We want to be able to, like, put together a kill on a blocker, for instance, things like that. And we've drawn Light Up the Stage, which just means the gas keeps on coming, but we don't even need to employ the extra gas. Opponent is just going to lose to our board. So... There we go, guys. Uh, like I said, like I said, we just kind of muscled our way through it. We kept drawing a lot of gasoline. Um, nothing like too crazy. Nothing ridiculously over the top. You know, we didn't have Monomorphosi. We only had one Bedlam Reveler, like, at the end of the game. So it wasn't ridiculous value, but it was just good, consistent. Again, that combination of pressure and value with Light Up the Stage playing a pretty key role early on. And uh, a high threat count as well. Like, we had a lot of turns that were pretty efficient in terms of, like, going wider and applying pressure with the opponent just, like, looping a fatal push every turn. It was good to always kind of be one body ahead of that or one step ahead of that, and that was how we came away with that game one win. Okay, so we are against the blue-black Urza deck, which basically operates, it's weird to sideboard against and even to kind of conceptualize, because it operates a lot like a blue-black Dimir control deck. It's got the thought seizes, the fatal pushes, it plays cryptic command, it plays other forms of interaction and permission. But they also play an artifact sub-theme that you need to contend with, including a combo. This is Wurza, and uh, they have a combo finisher, and the combo itself can acquire accrue some really important value along the way against a deck like ours. And finally, Urza himself is often the only creature in the entire 60, but you kind of have to kill him. He's kind of a must-answer card. So to that end, we have some kind of weird, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that sideboard decisions that we've made. I sided out two copies of Kiln Fiend because it's a little uh, bad against Fatal Push, and three copies of Forked Bolt because, again, we don't need to control their board besides Urza, and Forked Bolt does not do a very good job of that. So to that end, we bring in one copy of Dismember because it does kill Urza, three copies of Abrade because it can help kill Urza better than Forked Bolt or help kill the Construct or just outright kill the Construct, plus, of course, it answers all of their artifact stuff. And we also brought in one copy of Shrine of Burning Rage because they do take the game long a lot of the time. They do operate like a control deck. They probably do not have many good answers to Shrine. So that's how I decided. I'm pretty happy with it, but as always, you can let me know. And uh, this is a very solid hand. Three lands, including a can land, a one mana threat, the lightning bolt, the monomorphos, the top end of Reveler. You love to see all of that together. Opponent keeping seven with a very explosive start. We'll go Soul Scar and pass. So back to the OP. They're going to fetch, play another Astrolabe, and then play Nile Spellbomb. Nile Spellbomb is a bit of a problem, especially because we drew a Lava Dart last turn and our second Bedlam Reveler this turn. So again, we opened with some good stuff. A uh, couple clunky draws off the top in some ways, but we've still got a lot of gas. And then another Lava Dart. So we're, uh, you know, we're kind of... Uh, kind of setting ourselves up to get punished pretty hard by the spell bomb. But so we kind of split the difference. We go dart, bolt, smash in for four. Opponents down to ten. You know, it's a pretty good turn too, not gonna lie. But they do have some good stuff over there and probably some stuff in hand as well. They've got five cards after all, so it's back to us. Now this was interesting. I did decide to just 
crack the fiery eyelet here because we are simply like the floor of their turn is crack the spell bomb, see what they can see. But the fact that they didn't do it main phase means they've probably got something good to do anyway. So I decided that we're going to kind of give up on the Bedlam Reveler dream for now. And we are going to try to find a way to force damage through um, more proactively here. Ideally, we are trying to find like Monastery Swift Spear or just like Lightning Bolt, something like that. Instead, we find Kiln Fiend, which is fine, but... Uh, we'll just Lava Dart them, and our uh, Soul Scar connects, which did kind of surprise me. Opponent down to six, and then they fetch, and end step War of Invention for Thopter Foundry. So that's what they're up to, so that's pretty rough. They're going to Spell Bomb us, but they didn't even take the draw, even though they have all this open mana, which is really interesting. Means they've probably got something really good in hand. Again, their sequencing indicates that they kind of have whatever they need, right? They were, again, for two on our upkeep, finding Sword of the Meek, and this is just what we can't beat without an Abraid. So I just play out the Kiln Fiend. I attack, you know, we could Lava Dart here, and I thought about it, but I decided to kind of, like, bluff and and see if I could psych them out but in, into not blocking, but they just block and I just scoop because we don't beat the Thopter Foundry combo again unless we can kind of immediately answer the Thopter Foundry itself or and or we have board that's big enough to compete with it. Kiln Fiend is not good against the Thopter Foundry combo, even when the combo is just kind of for value. We need like a wide board and like a Bedlam Reveler to realistically batter through some Thopters, and we need more burn or more removal or something. We just have two dead cards in hand and a Lava Dart is just not going to do it. So I went for the super high upside play of like trying to <laughs> hope they don't block, basically. They do. We lose. What are you going to do? We are going to lose anyway, so might as well go for the upside, right? So a little bit tough, a little bit tough. You know, we had... The top of our deck not complying we, with... Uh, we had a really good 7 that we could have built on well, but a combination of their Nile Spellbomb and our clunky draws off the top and the fact that they had the combo lined up meant that they just effectively beat us here on turn 4. And it's all coming down to this one, guys. It is... Round 5, Game 3, playing for the 5-0, and oh, and I did make another sideboard tweak. I did side out my 4th Fort Bolt. To play a second Kiln Fiend, we are just, frankly, getting more threat-dense, more proactive on the play. That is all there is to that. And uh, we've got a kind of a risky one-land keep, but it is a keep nevertheless, in my view. Uh, Swifty is what we want on turn one in this matchup. We've got Crash Through to help hit the second land. We've got a Braid, two Burn Spells. We've got the top end of Rev. It's a really good one-lander. It is one that I did opt to keep. Uh, of course, hoping to see the opponent mull. Uh, the only opponent that's mulligan for us this league is Neoform, so Urza keeping seven. Not good, not good, right? And then they got turn one Spellbomb. So, we're hoping to draw the second land, and we immediately do. Pretty beautiful stuff, and honestly, I thought about just straight up abrading the Nile Spellbomb right then and there. But I also think there's a lot of merit to simply doing this. We go all in um, on the pressure and the damage, and crashing through on as early as possible helps us have the helps us see the most cards. Like seeing one more card can be the difference from a turn three kill and like a really clunky turn three, right? So I think either line's justifiable. We'll just have to see how it goes. Opponent fetching down to twelve. Finding the Thopter Foundry, well, part of me, of course, is happy that we did save the Abrade here because now we can answer the combo piece, so that's what I decide to do. We Abrade the Thopter Foundry, and then it's Lava Dart time, and I just shove all in here. We flash back the Lava Dart. We put them to six. We put them to six while we took care of their turn two play. It's pretty good, and we really... Have to hope they don't have anything else here that's too crazy. They're going to Nile Spell Bomb us. This time they do take the draw, so they're clearly digging for more action. Um, they play land number three after a bobble. They fetch, they draw, and then it's back to us. And they are dead to any burn spell in our deck off the top. As long as they don't have Fatal Push, they're dead to Bolt, to Spike, to Lava Dart. But instead we draw Soul Scar Mage. So, not very good. But also, far from dead. So we'll attack, and hey, Swifty connects. So we looks like we would have had lethal, but we'll just go Soul Scar pass. Again, they're even more dead now to any burn off the top. That's just what we gotta find. 
opponent taps out even for an Urza, so now permission can't save them. We just gotta rip the burn. We just gotta rip the burn. Their construct is only a 2-2, not that scary. Back to us, and we draw another creature. Oh, it's a disaster. It's a disaster. We just can't draw the finisher. But we're not out of the... They're not out of the woods yet, not by a long shot. So back to the opponent. Looks like they're tapping out again, and it is for Tezzeret the Seeker, who's going to tick down to make an Astrolabe of 5-5. Well, that's a little bit brutal, but again, they're just... They're not quite dead anymore to burn, but... Burn would still be a pretty good draw, right? Instead, we draw Dismember, which is actually quite good in its own right. Would have been really nice last turn, but we'll take it this turn as well. And you could argue for, like, Dismembering the Urza, and then hoping to basically out-top deck them or have more action in hand. But I don't think that's correct, because they have a full grip. They have five cards, we have a dead Bedlam Reveler in hand, so I decided that the best play now is to dismember, to get our two damage across, that way they are dead. They are dead to any burn spell, in and of itself. We don't even need to connect in it with a creature anymore. But opponent will float mana, tap the construct in Ether Gust, one of our one drops, our Soul Scar Mage, back to the library. I chose to put it on the bottom because we're just all in on drawing a burn spell. And we do get to connect for two because they had to tap. So once again, opponent just dead to burn. Uh, they'll tick Tezzeret up for that impulse mode. They find Bobble. They play Mystic Sanctuary buying back Ether Gust. Or is that a May? Maybe they didn't buy it back. Yeah, that's a May. So they, did, they didn't have to. And they didn't want to, which I think is the right call. They play Sword of the Meek, then they pass. So can we draw Lethal? Can we draw lethal? Well, we draw Fiery Islet, so can we draw lethal? Nope, we draw another Soul Scar Mage. We are just flooded with creatures here right at the end of this game. And opponent has just an amazing progression. They were for an Astrolabe, they bobble, so they're just churning through the deck, looking for answers. Tezzeret actually ticks up and whiffs, which is a little bit of a small blessing, but they've just got all kinds of stuff. They've got Bauble, they've got Aether Spellbomb, they cast another Urza, and it's just all spiraling completely out of control for us. But they only have one card in hand. They only have one card in hand, and maybe it's not permission. Maybe we can draw lethal. Maybe we'll finally draw one of our many, many burn spells. Instead, we draw Light Up the Stage. And we're going to cast it because we could light up into Land Bolt or Land Spike. But the opponent does have a response. Their last card is Cryptic Command. What a tilt. So that's that. Tezzeret takes down. He alts, quote unquote, uh, massive life point swing. And then they've just got overwhelmingly lethal on the crackback. And we are denied at the very last stage of the league. Our 5-0. and Oh, it was so close. It was so close. We just drew the wrong crap at the end of the game. There really isn't much more to say about it. I don't think there's really anything else we could have done about it either. Like, the only thing we could have done is maybe abraded the Nile Spellbomb on turn two on the play. But as I said, I think there were just as many, probably frankly, more incentives to save the abrade to go crash through whatever our other turn two play was. Was it just a burn spell? I think so. And set up for possibly give us a higher chance of a turn three kill and not have to worry about the spell bomb because they're just dead and or pressure them into doing other things and or being able to answer their combo piece as we did. So it did not pan out for us. Um, we ended up being so soft to the spell bomb Simply, but that is because we bricked. Like, I don't think we were, uh, with an average progression, that soft of the spell bomb. Again, we literally draw, like, one burn spell in this whole mix, and I think we win. I think we win. So, anyway, guys, that was our league. Let's do a quick wrap, wrap up here at the end. Okay, my friends, so I hope you enjoyed that. My win rate continues to be sky, sky high on this deck. Haven't gotten the 5-0 and yet, but almost literally always 4 and one which is an amazing place to be. And I think the deck's really well positioned. As for our changes here, um, Forked Bolt in this league didn't really shine 
uh, relative to firebolts or burst lightning. Uh, but it also was not a liability compared to those cards. It was all of these shocks, the shock variants would have been much of a muchness, as they say, in this particular league against these particular progressions and decks. Uh, the, I do... I do like the third copy of Kiln Fiend. I do like the third threat here. Um, Kiln Fiend was awesome. Kiln Fiend, in some cases, ended up just being, as we saw in round five, game one, enough muscle to get over the line. We just keep deploying threats, stay one step ahead of their spot removal. And against Neoform, it T3'd them. It stopped them from being able to combo off on us. Um, we are able to race people very well in the back of Kiln Fiend. As I said in the beginning, the other option, the other configuration would be only two Fiend and the fourth Reveler, but frankly, a lot of my losses come when I have Revelers dead in hand. I don't know how often you guys notice this, and even when they're good, often, like way too often it seems, I'm drawing like two or three even altogether, as we saw, I believe, in round one. Now, sometimes that's not that big of a deal. Sometimes you just want to draw and resolve the Reveler, and even though it's not as efficient as it could be when you have to pitch the extra one or two, you're still doing a lot of good stuff when, you, when the Reveler hits the field. I understand that. Nevertheless, you know... Losing to things like Spell Spellbomb with Reveler Rotting in hand, not a very good feeling. So I am disinclined to play the fourth one. I am much more inclined to maintain this 3-3 split on the evidence of this league. The exception to this is probably, of course, the Bobble list. If you're playing no two-drop threats and you're playing four Mishra's Bobble, I think you definitely want the fourth Reveler, even though the non-bows, uh, the clunkiness can get even worse. You definitely just want that fourth Rev. Um... And I, I do have to try that. I do want to try that. I just don't want to buy the overpriced baubles on MTGO. That's just why I haven't done it yet. But I will. I will at some point. Finally, you know, we don't want to get too judgmental after a sample size of one match. Or even one game of one match. But Leyline was pretty miserable uh, when we saw it here. Just like not doing what we needed it to do. And yeah, again, sample size one. Not not the most relevant, but I also have the philosophical, the structural, kind of the logical objections to playing Leyline in a meta like this in this deck. You know, if it's Hogak Summer, by all means, jam your Leylines. But right now, I think I still like Tormod's Crypt better, uh, and maybe a mix with Crypt and Surgical better. But as always, guys, I look forward to hearing your thoughts. I look forward to you letting me know what you think about the lines, the gameplay, the sideboarding, the content in general, and what your lists are looking like these days. Um, I have been getting more traction with the prowess content, so it's still dwarfed by the traction I'm getting on the midrange content, so I will continue, of course, to prioritize midrange because that's what most of my supporters want, and that's where most of the views come from. But the prowess views are up, and I hope they keep going up. I appreciate you for watching, and uh, please do consider supporting the channel. Even if you're a mono-red prowess player, you know, my Patreon content is geared toward the midrange stuff, but there's nothing wrong with uh, chipping in a few bucks to a content creator that you do enjoy. So link to that in the description below, as well as to my sponsor where you can get a discount and also help me out a little bit that way. Otherwise, you can subscribe to the channel, you can like, you can share, you can comment. Word of mouth, it all helps me grow, and I truly do appreciate everybody helping me out in any way they can. So thanks again, guys. And yeah, soon enough, we will play a live league here for you. Maybe when I buy the baubles, I'll try that out on camera, live recorded. I don't know. I don't know when that's going to happen, so we'll just have to see. But to be sure, more Mono Red Prowess content coming in the future. And as always, more black-based mid-range as well. Talk to you guys soon, and hope everybody out there has a wonderful day.